Gresham College presents The Legal Profession Regulating for Independence and Quality by the Baroness Deitch of Cumnall, DBE. I happened to be in the chamber of the House of Lords on the 21st of July 2009 when the House of Lords paid tribute to the law lords, there they are in their finery, just one woman, on their last appearance in the House of Lords before departure to the Supreme Court in the building across the square. It was an unexpectedly moving occasion, not only because of the loss of the presence of judges of distinction and wisdom who could, at the appropriate stage, make a great contribution to the work of the legislature, but also because of the keen realization that their distinction is recognized worldwide, in part because of their former inclusion in the Lords, and of course, because of the part they play in the shaping of the common law, their judicial work being accepted as amongst the finest in the world. I don't know how many lawyers there are in the room, but if there are those people, there really are household names here and abroad. Their departure was another example of the way in which the legal profession has been reconfigured to suit theories rather than reality in recent years. It also reminded me that the bar, which I regulate as chair of the Bar Standards Board, is the main supplier of judges, and that the quality of the Supreme Court's development of the law is and will be inextricably linked to the quality of the young barristers who join the profession. The Legal Services Act 2007 facilitates the relaxation of the structures of working that lawyers have known for decades. And that act governs the regulation of all branches of the legal profession. New ways of working together in future may be sought not for their own sake, but because they are inevitable under the Act and because of the economic pressure on the bar, not only from the recession, but because central government controls the purse strings of legal aid for many of the most socially valuable members of the profession. The tail of legal aid cuts is wagging the dog of British justice. Now that I'm in the position of administering parts of it, the Legal Services Act 2007 seems to me to be a rather unsatisfactory piece of legislation. It's grounded in the 2004 report by Sir David Clementi, a former Deputy Governor of the Bank of England. And his report was called a review of the regulatory framework for legal services in England and Wales. He was concerned with the then over complex existing regulatory framework, a mixture of oversight by professional bodies and government departments, largely self regulatory and without sufficient regard to the consumer. He was concerned about the complaint system and the restrictive nature of business practices. Though it would be fair to say, and accurate, that these two issues were more relevant to the solicitor's branch of the profession than to the bar. His recommendations differed somewhat from the eventual legislation of 2007, but the Act of that year, the Legal Services Act, addressed the problems that he had identified. The profession was no longer to be self-regulating, but overseen by a new legal services board. Its powers were to some extent to be devolved to the current frontline regulators. For these purposes, the Bar Council, uh, overseeing barristers and the Law Society for solicitors. But they're both obliged to separate out their regulatory and representative functions, just as the General Medical Council and the British Medical Association are separated. So we have the Bar Council regulating the Bar and the Bar Standards Board. Sorry, the Bar Council represents the Bar and the Bar Standards Board regulates it. The Law Society represents the solicitors and the Solicitors Regulation Authority regulates them. Not to mention the Council of Licensed Conveyances, 
the Chartered Institute of Legal Executives, which has a regulatory arm called uh, Silex Professional Standards Limited, the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys and the Institute of Trademark Attorneys, the Intellectual Property Regulation Board, the Association of Cost Lawyers and the Cost Lawyers Standards Board, and the Master of the Faculties acting for the notaries. For the purposes of this hour, I will concentrate on the best known branches of the legal profession. The bar, which has about 15,000 members, and the solicitors, which have about 10 times as many. The second major change by the Act was the introduction of new ownership structures um, for legal firms and chambers, in particular allowing non-lawyers to own and manage firms, which will be called alternative business structures and legal disciplinary practices or multidisciplinary practices. In other words, lawyers working with other professionals, a one-stop shop, sometimes nicknamed Tesco Law. The third change is a new portal for complaints about lawyers' poor service, the legal ombudsman, although charges of professional misconduct are still reserved to the professional body, the Bar Standards Board in my case. The two types of complaint have to be disentangled. It doesn't take much description to see that rather than sorting out the maze of regulation that Clementi identified, the statute adds to it. It may result in over-regulation, duplication of regulation, and competitive regulation, none of it cost-capped. The cost of the Legal Services Board and its demands are serious issues, for the bar would have to contemplate rises in the annual practicing fee to fund it, were it to go up at a time of constraint. And it also has to fund the new scheme of quality assessment of advocacy, the Office of Legal Complaints, an education review, and diversity data collection. More than that, it's arguable that the bar was caught up in the slipstream of the criticisms that were levelled at the handling of complaints by solicitors. And the heavy structure of the Legal Services Act 2007 is not suited to a smaller profession as the bar. Or one might even surmise that there was a hidden plot to crush the bar out of all recognition. If we are to have a fused profession, then let us at least be upfront about it and start with training that is common to intending solicitors and intending barristers, allowing them the freedom to specialise a few years along the line when their professional talents are more clearly developed. Another problem is that the new working structures are backed by no practical evidence at all to show that they will offer improved services to clients. The biggest problem with the law is its non-affordability, multiplied many times over by recent cuts in legal aid. The welfare of the users of the bar has to be our first consideration. We have not heard much from the public about what they want, despite the proliferation of consumer panels and surveys. Maybe the issues are just too complex and variable, depending on the economic climate, and the simple desire of the public, I guess, for direct, affordable legal advice, which is thwarted more by the economic climate than by the lawyers themselves. Clementi was trying to reconcile at least three different drivers of regulation. To liberalise, that is, allowing competition to flourish and access to be more visible. To protect the public through careful and independent regulation with a special focus on complaints handling, which had been the bete noire of the law society, that's the solicitors. And to move on from the failures of the big bang in the financial markets. The lessons from that, the financial failures, still do not seem to have been learned or even spelled out. The motivating principles of competition and consumerism behind the Legal Services Act were actually formulated in about 2000, a different economic climate altogether. There was a report back then from the Office for Fair Trade about competition in the professions. 
and in relation to barristers, it criticised them for restrictions such as not being permitted to form partnerships, not permitting much direct access to clients or the conduct of litigation. But this was all before the Big Bang in the financial world and its dreadful results. In the era of Mrs. Thatcher, the cry went up that the professional divisions between stockbrokers and stock jobbers in the stock exchange should go. The divisions between clearing banks and merchant banks should go. That there should be a free market of unfettered competition and deregulation. And if it wasn't a serious lecture, I'd say ho ho. And that computer technology was to be king. There was established the Financial Services Authority and light touch regulation. I am no economist, but I would not be alone in pointing out that meltdown and bank collapses resulted. And the Financial Services Authority seemed to have no power to prevent any of this or stop any innocents from losing. Indeed, the Financial Services Authority is about to be dismantled. Without any regard to this history, a similar attitude has been taken to legal regulation. There may well be risks in the alternative business structures which are going to be introduced. For example, the influence of outside ownership, profit over professional standards, commodification of legal issues, fewer firms in rural areas and in high streets, and unacceptability of British legal practices abroad where other nations have more careful professional rules. Alternative business structures, that's mixing lawyers with non-lawyers in a partnership, are not allowed in the USA and not in Germany, and Germany has urged an international stand against them. Barristers who work in a partnership and entity will be conflicted out once one party to potential litigation has engaged someone in the entity, whereas at the moment there's no conflict when one barrister in a set of chambers is engaged. Someone in the same case can go to another barrister in the same set of chambers and there's no conflict. This could greatly restrict justice, that's the new structures, and choice in small towns where there aren't many barristers, especially those who specialize in, for example, family law. The client is obviously important to the barrister. But from the barrister's perspective, the client is not just the man or woman who comes off the street seeking legal advice. The bar serves solicitors, judges, big corporations, government departments, foreign governments, anyone who seeks the support of English law. It seems to me that the preservation of a distinct profession of barrister is actually in the interests of the public because the barrister can and will defend those clients whom commercial legal outlets might ignore because the barrister's overriding duty is to the court to assist in the development of the law and protect those who need that protection. <coughs> Sometimes that duty involves telling the court about matters that the client would rather not be revealed. Barristers are bound by the cab rank rule, which means that they take the next one who comes along, regardless of acceptability. And it is accordingly recognized that the barrister is not himself or herself to be identified with an unpopular client. Clients in future will need to know that in-house advocacy in alternative business structures is not the only option. In their interests, that's the public, the access of regional solicitors firms to the bar needs to be kept open and clients should be protected from the quarreling of barristers in big firms that have in-house advocates, reducing their availability at large. If I can give you an example from the medical profession, which is perhaps easier to understand. If you go to your GP who thinks there's something seriously wrong with you, you expect your GP to refer you to a specialist. It may mean that you have to travel, hopefully not too far, but the GP can identify a specialist. You wouldn't want your GP to say, well, um, 
the only specialist in town is working for another practice, I can't refer you to him, or we've got a specialist in this surgery, he's a specialist in kidneys, but I expect he can look at your heart as well. You expect to go to the specialist in whatever condition it is that you might have. The same with the law. Now, many might have thought that the Act of 2007 was designed simply to usher in modified ways of working for the bar. But it is panning out amongst modern and generally accepted perceptions of how a profession should operate, not least of which is diversity. There is a range of altruistic activities of the bar, such as the pro bono, that's free work, and the attention paid to ensuring that the most able young pupils can come to the bar with financial assistance from the inns and chambers. In an age when social mobility is a trope, when it has been impeded, mobility has been impeded by government policies in education, such as university fees, and yet is demanded of the professions, the Bar of England and Wales has a proud record. The most recent figures indicate that around 14% of new pupillages are taken by black and ethnic minority graduates and that women, as in other professions, form a good half of the entrance. Retention is another matter, and its shortcomings are not confined to the legal profession. The bar is one of those professions that operates almost 24-7, and therefore, like medicine, is not family friendly. The bar is not a unitary profession anymore, nor is it under single control. It's made up of various types of barristers, as you see from that diagram, the Crown Prosecution Service, Government Legal Service, and self-employed barristers, who are the majority. And who controls the bar? Well, the body I chair, the Bar Standards Board, regulates conduct, discipline, education, and training. The Bar Council is the trade union, and they do representation fees collection and member services. The inns of court train in advocacy, support discipline, ethics, and provide a collegial background. And the specialist bar associations support education and training in the various specialties, for example, family law, criminal law, um, personal injury law, and so on. Now, it seems to me that an independent legal profession is very important and I'm worried about whether the 2007 Act might go towards undermining it. Lest it be thought that I'm suffering from regulatory capture, let me first list why it is so widely believed that the governance of the bar should be taken out of the cloisters of the inns and the bar council and led blinking into the daylight of Westminster and Whitehall. First of all, Legal advice is too expensive. Although cost is not a regulatory matter, there's not much I can do about it. The cost has moved barristers out of the reach of the middle classes. The advice of a top barrister is affordable by government, by corporate bodies, and by wealthy individuals, especially women in divorce. This has been, and is even today, ameliorated by legal aid insurance, pro bono work, conditional fees, and better use of technology. But there is still a void. Legal aid has been cut and will be cut even more in the management of the UK budget deficit. And I'll return to this issue as it bears on the independence of the legal profession. So there are many, perhaps the majority of the population, who could never contemplate accessing the individual advice of a barrister or a city solicitor. It is reported, often with pride, certainly by the journals of the solicitor's profession, that partners in city firms make one million pounds a year, and some barristers make similar sums from criminal legal aid. But we also know that there are barristers, many of them women and black and ethnic minorities, who undertake publicly funded work, that's legal aid work, in criminal and family issues, and make only the most modest of livings. 
but their pleas are undermined by the excesses at the other end. In the past, the need for wealth in order to secure or become a lawyer was conveniently overlooked in protestations of universal justice and independence. So there are calls for change. Turning to the critical aspects, there's no doubt that over the last few decades, the Law Society, that's the solicitor's body, was not only tardy in handling complaints, but unresponsive. Solicitors have also been tainted by the outcome of a monopolizing of work by a few firms representing unionized claimants. For example, miners suffering from lung diseases caused by their work in the mines. The legal firms who represented them succumbed to temptation by taking more for themselves than for their clients, and even in a few cases, taking what was not theirs at all. The reports of those failings made an indelible impression and convinced me that it is clear that referral fan fees should be banned. And I welcome the recent ban relating to them in personal injury cases in the Legal Aid, Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Act 2012. What's a referral fee? For example, the practice of solicitors paying estate agents to send them clients. For they take away choice, cost more, and reduce competition. If you're buying a house as an estate agent and they say, oh, you really must go to our uh, well-known reputable firm, Sue Grabbit and Run, just down the high street, you want to ask whether Sue Grabbit and Run is not paying the estate agent to send them work, and whether you wouldn't be better off with another firm another street away. Quite rightly, the call has gone up for affordability, access and competence in the legal profession. It's been asked why the changes that have affected business globally should not transform the business of the lawyer. IT, flexi working, outsourcing should make advice more readily obtainable and cheaper. Other businesses have been affected by or improved by deregulation, free market competition, the dominance of client choice and consumer sovereignty. So too, some say, should the provision of legal services change. This is, of course, to ignore the financial crises of this century, the reasons for and the results of which are still working themselves out, and where the part played by liberalization of the market has yet to be analyzed. It also sits uneasily with the demand voiced on behalf of the consumer for accountability and regulation, often where trust was once sufficient. For example, the medical profession and hospitals, banks and lawyers. Remember the old days when you go to a local bank in the high street, there would be a bank manager or great respectability. You could phone him, you trusted him. And now all you get is a central number Press one, press two, you know the story. On the one hand, there are calls for ever greater integrity and competence with accountability. On the other, for deregulation, deregulation liberalization, and entry into the professions of competitors with different training. This is all hard to square. We have yet to work out the reconciliation of consumerism and ethics. As we've seen from the controversy over the recent Health and Social Welfare Act and in the ongoing debates about the provision of education, there are certain pillars of our society which we all expect to be above commercial considerations and to act as public good. Legal advice, I would suggest, is one of them. Market forces are not always to the good. And now the rule of law. I've told you about the bad side, and it is that image that's driven reform. Taking into account, however, the historic role played by lawyers and the independent judiciary in the enduring constitutional stability of the UK, I come hot foot from the House of Lords, where the red carpet and various diamonds are still scattered around from the visit of the Queen this morning. That's our constitutional stability. 
There are important values to be retained, no matter how much reform is implemented and needed. Let us consider the rule of law and the part played in it by the independence of the legal profession. Common lawyers take for granted the rule of law, but there have been recent attempts to spell it out, more so in times of crisis for the law. It is widely agreed that it means, inter alia, that no one shall be denied the benefit of the law or its consequences. The late lamented Lord Bingham, who was regarded as one of the finest, if not the finest judge of his generation, died a couple of years ago, devoted some of his last writing to the rule of law. And amongst the seven defining principles he identified were included the independence of judges and lawyers. A Canadian writer, Gordon Tariff, puts it like this, the judgment of lawyers should not be influenced by any consideration other than the need for them to discharge the loyalty they owe each of their clients, subject to the higher duty to themselves, the court, the state, and fellow lawyers. There are several potential conflicts here which could bear analysis. But the general meaning is that the lawyer needs to be independent in his or her handling of the client's case and also independent of the government. Lord Bingham was by no means uncritical of the profession. He said that there should be unimpeded access to the courts in order to secure human rights and the rule of law, and that there can be no judicial development of these concepts unless the cases are brought to court by the lawyers, often acting under the cab rank rule. He also acknowledged the detrimental effect of excess earnings and the shrinking of legal aid. He concluded that lawyers are necessary to the rule of law, but they are also guilty of impeding it if they price themselves out of reach. It is widely alleged that independence entails that the legal profession should be independent of outside regulation and be able to regulate its own affairs, conduct its own disciplinary issues and determine its own entrance standards. The evil otherwise being government decisions about who may or may not practice. Witness the persecution of lawyers in Nazi Germany, which was the first act of Hitler. In Iran today, and in certain African countries. In fact, the first act of a dictator who wishes to subdue protests is likely to be the control of the lawyers. We see it in China, for example, every week. Lest this be thought to be professional self-serving, this independence is echoed in international conventions. The United Nations basic principles on the role of lawyers, the code of conduct for lawyers in the European Union, and the International Bar Association have all laid down principles of self-regulation and unimpeded access to clients. Why does independence matter? It is to enable clients and organizations to challenge the government of the day. It is to secure interpretation and application of the legislation by persons without conflicting loyalties. It is inseparable from the enforcement of human rights. No less a person than the great South African lawyer Sidney Kentridge has said that in apartheid South Africa, there were frequent threats from the government to place the bar under the control of a central council with government-nominated members. He said that his fears were reawakened by the proposals in the United Kingdom that were the forerunners of the Legal Services Act 2007 because, he said, they would obviously increase the power of the government to control the legal profession. And in the hands of another Lord Chancellor, less committed to the independence of the bar, destroy it. He knew from his experience that it is the bar or those lawyers who choose advocacy that ultimately stand between the citizen and the overbearing state and act as a bulwark. Whether it was the brave South African lawyers who tried to defend Nelson Mandela decades ago, 
or whether it is the lawyers even today who defend Abu Qatada or whoever the terrorist of the week is, they stand between the citizen and the government and act as a bulwark. It also follows from this assertion that the bar should control the education that fits its recruits. The nature of the job that they do clearly requires knowledge of the law and procedure and skill in advocacy. And those abilities will not be found in every candidate and therefore need to be tested. Even Richard Abel, a writer who casts a critical eye over this high-minded approach, accepts the need for a profession that mediates between citizen and state, redresses civil wrongs, manages family disputes, and articulates human rights. He points out that while the bar claims to need a distance between the advocate and the client in order to meet conflicting obligations to adversaries, to adversaries and the legal system, this is inconsistent with the demand of the bar in the last 20 years for more direct access simply in order to compete with solicitors. He also comments that there is no evidence that employed barristers' independence is compromised, which is true as far as we know. What does the client want from regulation? They may know nothing about the law and may never before or ever after have had recourse to the bar, but they want their case advocated to the best of the barrister's ability, and they want advice of the highest order, skill and integrity comparable to the expectations of the patient who's referred to a consultant or surgeon. And the barrister needs recognition of his or her duty. That is recognition of the overriding duty to the court. Otherwise, the very system that the client is relying on will not support him or her. Law needs a measure of predictability. And the notion of duty to the court is vital because it ensures impartiality, that all proper disclosures are made, that the law applies to everyone, the opponent, the criminal, and the victim, or those he does business with, win or lose. In other words, the barrister's behavior is at the essence of the rule of law. As Lord Denning said, quoting Fuller, be you ever so high, the law is above you. And by that he meant not the hierarchy of regulators, but the rule of law. And that is why fusion of barristers with solicitors may not be for the best of all possible worlds. When it comes to the new notion of the legal profession undertaking business in different legal structures in partnership with other professionals, and those structures and boringly known as entities, the Bar Standards Board will be looking to regulate those who want to do advocacy and sign up to their standards. It will not compete with the regulation offered by the Solicitor's Regulation Authority. The Bar Standards Board entities will not handle client cash and will have restrictive rules about outside investment. It would be contrary to the spirit of the Legal Services Act 2007 if it did not give free rein to various models of entities. Let a thousand flowers bloom, even in the legal profession. The bar and the solicitors should agree on differentiating their professions. They, the solicitors, will have in their remit a mixed bag. They've got the magic circle of city firms and the mixed disciplinary alternative business structures. The bar will regulate entities that offer what the bar offers as individuals, that is specialist advice, including that given by the employed bar and advocacy. Sometimes it is asked why there should not be one legal profession with no differentiation. There is one legal profession, but different sectors of it serve different demands in the justice system. The advocate, usually, but not always a barrister, is court facing supporting the civil and criminal justice system as administered in the courts, giving advice as a preliminary to or as an alternative to going to court, owing a duty to the court above the demands of the client if they clash, and thereby assisting in the development of the law by the judges and their ability to do justice impartially. 
That is why the modish outcomes-focused regulation, which I will look at in more detail in my next lecture, is largely not relevant, relevant to the advocate who appears in court. The English legal system is procedure-oriented, rather like a serious game that has to be played by the rules. The rules are not merely means to an end. They are an end in themselves and intrinsic to the rule of law itself. Thus, while we may all, for example, deplore the delay in the deportation of a terrorist, we do not deny that he has the right to lodge an appeal against his deportation within three months, whatever that may mean, because those are the rules and they are designed to do justice. What about the judiciary? A very important product of the independence of the bar is the consequent independence of the judiciary, both in terms of mindset and in action. Each protects the other, and neither can be independent on their own, contradictory though that sounds. In fact, the current legal climate the judges face, they face state disparagement as a result of their decisions in cases involving, for example, immigrants and terrorists, and protection of their independence is especially important. It should be of assistance that the inns of court surround them as they defend the citizen from the government or from ill-thought-out legislation. The connection is vital as long as the judges are appointed from the bar. The independence of solicitors is equally important as and when more judges are appointed from that branch. Their independence is less frequently mentioned but has occasionally been regarded as under threat, in particular since the reforms brought about by their own past conduct. It may be that it, in other words, their independence has irretrievably gone because solicitors' actions are circumscribed by the need of their firm to make a living for all its members. That is why it is legitimate to be concerned about the possible move of many lawyers, barristers, solicitors, conveyancers, legal executives, into corporate entities where the corporate personality might be perceived to be the dominant one. And now a short history of regulation, a lovely topic. Independence has a history, and it took centuries to reach its peak, which is past. Given the controversial part played by lawyers, and in particular the impact of modern business methods, it isn't surprising that the arguments rehearsed here are not new. The tussle between independence on the one side and on the other cost control, anti-competitiveness, consumerism and government regulation goes back some decades. Or it may be turned professionalism on the one side versus the market on the other. The Royal Commission on Legal Services in 1979 considered all these issues. Its report ruled out partnerships, came down in favour of a two-branch profession, and stressed independence and self-regulation. But the perception of lawyers by the public and in the media remained adverse, little though that may matter. Reform has been formulated expressly to curb the independence of the legal profession, building on the feeling that it is a self-serving gentleman's club. The genesis of change, as with so much of English law today, was partly European. The European Commission Competition Directorate wanted to make the professions more competitive, and the Office of Fair Trading wanted the same both organisations aiming at existing restrictions on forms of business organisation and conduct. I note that there has been no similar onslaught on the practices of doctors, unless one counts the new powers to be devolved to GPs to organise commissioning of services, albeit that the effectiveness of doctors has been weakened by the European restrictions placed on their working hours and the inability up to now to test their working command of the English language. As the proposals for regulation developed, they came to be taken into account not only the client's interests, but also the legal system and consumerism, allegedly for the benefit of society. The legal profession was changing in any case. It had grown, 
and more barristers were working in employment, competing with solicitors for the business of price-conscious clients. Many depend on a few large firms for much of their work or on legal aid. The curbs on the bar are in reality shrinking legal aid, lower remuneration, more young people seeking to come to the bar than there are positions for them, and the possible reduction of reserved services, that is, services that only lawyers can undertake. Insurers, too, have great power because the rise in premiums might prevent lawyers doing cheaper or more adventurous work. Despite the very real responses of the bar to the needs of clients, the government has played the consumer card, if you wish to be cynical. Some argue that the claim to regulate in the interests of consumers is a ploy to enable the government to curb the freedom of the bar, ostensibly in the interests of society. And this is evidenced by disagreement over who the consumer is. On the governmental side, the consumer is depicted as the woman in the street needing advice about a divorce or a tenancy. On the professional side, the consumer is seen as a broader group of those with an interest in or affected by the law. The judges, the government departments, business, solicitors, the rule of law itself. There is a genuine need to make legal services more widely available in terms of price, method, and competence. This may militate against lawyer independence because the fees they charge are their own business, unless and until they come under the control of the state through legal aid and fixed fee regulations. The Legal Services Board, however, has put the consumer first in practice, although there are seven objectives for regulators to follow in the Legal Services Act, following on the report that I mentioned earlier by Sir David Clementi. Lord Newberger, in a recent speech, drew attention to the uneasy compromises, saying that the ethos of consumer society is not necessarily ethical. The bar itself prefers to prioritize the public interest as a regulatory objective as well as to pay significant regard to the so-called professional principles listed in the same section of the Legal Services Act. The professional principles are that lawyers should act with independence and integrity, maintain proper standards of work, and act in the best interest of their clients, that advocates should comply with their duty to the court to act with independence in the interest of justice, and that the affairs of clients should be kept confidential. The Legal Services Act 2007, by and large, enacts the recommendations made by Sir David Clementi. And they are carried out by its creature, the Legal Services Board, which is non-lawyer dominated. Having a lay majority has its benefits, but also has its drawbacks in lack of knowledge of how practice works. For example, the Legal Services Board has required every barrister to give his or her client, when they first meet, a document informing the client how to complain about the barrister. Now, the client may well only first meet the barrister in the cells before trial. The client may not speak English, may be in considerable stress and about to face a long sentence hardly the moment at which to undermine confidence in the professional relationship by emphasizing the possibility of complaint. All the more so, as if the client is found guilty, he's bound to want to object in one way or another. Imagine going to your GP in some pain and the first thing that's handed to you at reception is how to complain. The mechanisms of government control are now in place. The Legal Services Board and its consumer panel are appointed with the approval of the Lord Chancellor, who is now firmly a politician himself after his removal from the Woolsack. The consumer panel and the Office of Fair Trade are to advise the Legal Services Board on the appointment of approved regulators of the new legal entities, the mixed partnerships, 
The Legal Services Board can cancel the designation of an approved regulator, such as the Bar Council, and the Lord Chancellor could appoint the Legal Services Board as an approved regulator. So the Legal Services Board could seize control of parts of the legal profession with government approval. The Legal Services Board can recommend cancellation of designation as an approved regulator if the regulator has not observed the regulatory objectives, that's them, listed in the Act, which include the interests of consumers. It is not clear from the Act whose view is to prevail if the Legal Services Board and the frontline regulators, that's the bar and the solicitors, disagree over the meaning of those objectives up there. This is important given that the Legal Services Board has the power to fine and to levy fees for its support from the profession, which has no way of challenging the budget save through a central government department. There is therefore a real threat with only the wafer-thin possibility of judicial review as a shield. Moreover, the Legal Services Board has stated that it supports the Ministry of Justice in its work not, for example, putting the rule of law ahead of the Ministry of Justice. It therefore has every facility to be the tool of government policy. There are two branches of the legal profession, as I've said. There is also a move to fragment the professions within themselves and against each other. This takes the form of gradual obliteration of the dividing lines, while solicitors have High Court advocacy rights. So the bar wishes to move to more direct access and the ability to undertake litigation. The boundaries between the two branches of the profession are now perceived to be shifting to meet the new needs of clients, albeit that fusion is not on the agenda for the moment. If barristers work in partnerships with solicitors, the distinction will be hard to perceive. How does one balance all these needs? Self-regulation used to be totally appropriate because of the relatively small size of the bar, its concentration in London, and a few other centres, and the constant surveillance by peers, judges, and solicitors. This obviated the need for outside regulation. But now self-regulation has a bad name. Self-regulation, if left unchecked, can become self-interest. That's the risk that must be guarded against. We need appropriate checks and balances in place to ensure that self-regulation does what is necessary to reinforce independence. That is, organise the profession to ensure that its members genuinely support the rule of law and the proper administration of justice. It was thought in England and Wales that self-regulation had indeed got too close to being self-interest in practice. Arguably, the reforms of the 2007 Act go too far to control self-regulation in that they may restrict independence. The pendulum may swing too far in the opposite direction. At a conference of European lawyers 18 months ago, one of these conferences where 47 nations sit around the table and everyone has a little flag in front of them, I was asked by the delegates from a state newly liberated from communist rule whether the English legal profession had not lost its famous independence. I was mortified. Proper self-regulation ought to be possible and effective if the profession follows the Nolan principles of integrity in public service and, above all, controls misconduct swiftly and decently. Nevertheless, barristers are now in a minority on the board of the Bar Standards Board. The Bar has firmly separated the representative and regulatory arms of its governance and did so even in advance of the 2007 Act. The Bar Standards Board has achieved a satisfactory level of independence from the Bar Council and it needs to get this message across to the public. The Bar still controls who becomes a barrister through the Inns of Court and by the Bar Standards Board's authorisation of providers of the Bar Professional Training Course, subject of course to the law of the land in relation to discrimination and equality. 
the bar is subject to further de facto controls. There's a new Judicial Appointments Commission choosing judges. The code of conduct by which the bar works is growing in bulk. The bar's work is molded by the requirements of legal aid. Advancement to the position of QC is also through a commission and another external body will administer the proposed new scheme of advocacy assessment. Complaints about poor service are handled by the new Office for Legal Complaints. By the way, you will recognize Rumpel, won't you? And uh, one of the earliest women barristers, that's Rose Hardwon, if I, if I recollect. Uh, there's going to be a new Office for Legal Complaints and only misconduct complaints will be handled by the Bar Standards Board. Third party players, insurance premiums and the media all play a part in holding the Bar to account to the outside world. I've said that fusion is not on the agenda. It may be difficult for non-lawyers to appreciate why there is virtue in the separateness of the bar, especially when other common law countries have fused professions and make equally valid claims to independence. My impression as a non-barrister, but a well, a non-practitioner, but a student and teacher of the law, is that there is great merit in the division. It fosters independence in the bar, not just of practice, but of spirit, the shouldering of responsibility for the decision, regardless of anything except the client and the court. It allows for the most advanced development of the skill of advocacy. It ensures that even the most unpopular of clients has representation. It provides a system whereby a barrister may stand up to the government on behalf of, say, a terrorist, without being identified with the client. It fosters the highest standards because each barrister is the object of her fellow barrister's inspection and competitive spirit. It provides the collegiality and protection of the inns. Its very existence is a guarantee of the rule of law because the loyalty is to the client and the court, not to the earning capacity of the entity or partnership. Those qualities militate against fusion, even though solicitors too practice advocacy. What about the future? Hopefully, bar regulation will protect its independence and preserve what is distinctive and best about it in the interest of the rule of law and of society, while allowing it to modernize, indeed to survive. It is, after all, one of the stated objectives of the Legal Services Act 2007 to encourage a strong, diverse, and independent legal profession. If we ever become downhearted, we have but to remember what Erskine said on representing Tom Paine, who got up the noses of the government in 1792. From the moment that any advocate can be permitted to say that he will or will not stand between the crown and the subject, in the court where he daily sits to practice. From that moment, the liberties of England are at an end. We have very good reason in the current climate to be grateful to the bar for its ability to defend the citizen from his or her government in many countries of the world. And the bar exports its education, training, personnel, and advocacy skills all over the world. And we hope that the spirit of independence is infectious. Thank you very much. Uh, the legal profession protects itself like the medical profession. Uh, the Law Society took a solicitors from hell website off the um, web last year. I wonder what the redress, if you had a complaint against the Law Society, would be. Would you have to go through the legal ombudsman or what? Yes. I mean, I know less about regulating solicitors, in fact, very little, than I do about the bar. But if you've got a complaint against an individual solicitor, you start by going to the firm. And if that doesn't work, which is quite likely, you go to the Office of Legal Complaints, this chap here, Adam Sampson. 
They've had more trouble with complaints than really should be the case over the years. Uh, gentleman here. Um, my impression is that uh, lawyers get bad press about every 400, uh, 400 years. Edward I dealt with lawyers in 1275, um, requiring them, uh, punishing them for beguiling the court or, um, sorry, deceiving the court or beguiling the party on pain of imprisonment for a year and a day. And a little while later, in 1289, Edward I dismissed all of his judges but two for corruption. In 1628, there was the Petition of Right, where, where lawyers were forbearing to proceed against wrongdoers. And in 1641, there was the issue of the ship, ship's money judges. So I think that now we're sort of like kind of ripe for a bit, a bit of a clean out um, in both, both, both these areas, lawyers and, lawyers and judges. My personal experience, I've come across cases where lawyers have missed acts of parliament and courts for five and a half years have missed acts of parliament in the Fisher case in the Pikowski case, in the Etherington case, is all, all, all modern cases, even in one of the four cases in the Hall versus Simon. Um, if the state was controlling um, lawyers by the 1275 statute for 673 years until as recently as 1948, I don't think the, the, the bar or all the solicitors can have any claim to, to be seeking independence at all. Independence of what? Independence from the other branch of the professional independence from control by the state. I think the state has a, has a big, big duty to get involved in this area where justice is concerned. And one, one other point I wanted to, to mention before you reply is that when the Wonder vs Worsley decision came in in 1966 and created a fictional immunity for barristers for negligence, I mean, that was known in English law, it's mentioned in the Mirror of the, Mirror of the Justices, going, going back prior to 12, 1275, negligence of lawyers. So we've kind of like mollycoddled uh, the legal profession in, in many ways in re recent years, and with, by, not, by not allowing or having, having this, this fictional immunity, clients haven't been able to pursue barriers of negligence in that period of 30, 34 years. Um, so there's probably a, a number of cases that, that will, be, will be coming up as soon as people can, can find, find a way to um, get, 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 into, get into the courts to seek, to seek redress for these, for these kind of things. Um, there are a number of difficult circular elements in, in what you say. Let me start with the latter point about suing barristers for negligence, which you can now do. And of course, you can complain about them. The trouble with suing your lawyer for negligence is that basically you may often be trying to rehear the case itself. If you've lost the case, you may think that it's because of your barrister's negligence. I mean, I myself have been involved in, I don't know, four or five cases as far up as the Court of Appeal, win some, lose some. And in the end, it wasn't because the barrister did anything wrong. It was simply that the law was developing in a way that was against what I thought w was the right path. So that's tricky. I and mean, you can now complain. I mean, Adam Sampson is running a good office, and you, you can complain there about improper professional service. If they've broken the code of conduct, then there's a different way of handling it. But the complaints mechanism has been beefed up, for sure. Um, and now, independence. Now, the trouble is, if you let the government control the lawyers, what do you think the outcome is going to be? Because what the bar does, to a large extent, is challenge the law that the government has passed and wants to see enforced. So, in theory, anyway, control of lawyers by the government would mean that the government can pass a law, no matter how much it's in breach of human rights or how badly it's drafted or how unpopular it is, and then, at the same time, the government can squash any effective opposition or challenge to that law. You need someone different to look at the application and interpretation of the law from the body that made the law and had a particular motive in passing it. So independence ought to help the citizen, not the government. If you go to countries where the government controls the legal system, it is not good news. It really isn't. Lady here. Of course, Thank the you. biggest threat uh, is, is the cutting of legal aid. And you know, I'm along with anyone who's, who says that is deplorable because the one thing that stops people getting legal advice and challenging the government is, of course, uh, the cuts in legal aid. And quite how that is going to work out, I really don't know. 
Uh, thank you. No, I agree with your comments on legal aid. Um, I want to speak in kind of two capacities. One as a former lawyer and former teacher of lawyers, and second as the chair of a national consumer organization to respond to some of your comments about uh, consumers having an impact on you know, the, the passing of the Legal Services Act. I mean, I agree with you that eight regulators, to me that seems absolutely bonkers, far too many regulators. And also what I find quite worrying is a whole area of law which really touches people, affects people, will writing is not properly covered, in my opinion, under the Legal Services Act. So that is a huge worry. As uh, speaking now as a consumerist, and I have to say that that word consumerist or consumerism, in my opinion, has been hijacked by government, are used for their own purposes, and uh, they've developed a kind of ideology around choice, which is not necessarily something, I'm not saying that consumers are not in favor of choice, but they're also in favor of transparency, access, and a whole variety of other things. Um, we tried to make representations on uh, the Legal Services Bill as it then was. I have to say that many MPs were not the slightest bit interested in hearing our representations. We'd had a similar experience many years ago with Lord Mackay, who was the person who was responsible for introducing conditional fees. Uh, many lawyers and many so-called consumerists like myself said this is going to lead to ambulance chasing, to claims firms, uh, you know, this is not going to be good for the development of legal services. Um, so, to sort of summarize really, it is quite hard as a consumer or a consumer organization to have your voice heard in Parliament even when you have an informed opinion. And uh, as a result, I think, what we have under the Legal Services Act is, a, well, an experiment uh, in legal services, which um, I do not think in the end will be for the benefit of consumers. Um, the Ministry of Justice is in the process of reviewing the operation of the Legal Services Act right now, something called a triennial review. I agree with you about will writing, but it was announced only about a week ago that it will in future be regulated. And I think that's absolutely right. I cannot imagine anyone writing a will, even a simple one, who hasn't had a full legal training. Imagine a consumer says, I want a will written. Let's imagine the consumer is, let's say, in the middle of a divorce, and he's living with a girlfriend, and he's got a baby, and he's got a timeshare in a flat in Greece. Um, I, you know, you can see the problems building up, and you need to know family law, will writing law, intestacy, family law, tax law, European law, rule against perpetuities, you name it. I cannot imagine a profession of just will writers. So I'm glad they're going to be regulated, but I think they will have to get swept up to, into a broader uh, training. It's like saying, I'm going to train to be a prescription writer. Well, no, you can't train to be a prescription writer. Uh, you've got to know what it is that you're doing. Um, so I welcome the fact that will writing will be brought into reserved legal activity. I mean, it may be all right for some people to go to WH Smith and pick up a form and fill it in. But of course, the problems won't be revealed until after they died. And I was very amused to read there was some survey of clients of will writers, and it said they were satisfied. So I said, has there been a resurrection? Because, you know, you're not going to know <laughs> um, whether your will works out OK until it's far too late. You know, your relatives are, are left to deal with it. So I'm glad that's going to be brought into regulation. But one should not underestimate the amount of education one will need in law to be able to, to, to write a will. And as far as the consumer goes, I think the best protection is to have the highest possible standards of uh, education for the lawyers that you deal with, whether they're in entities whether they're in the local co-op, whether they're in the inns of court. But the big problem, which no one can crack, is affordability. I don't know what's going to happen to Citizens Advice Bureau. They're being uh, cut as well. I find that extraordinary. I've probably said this before. I'll say it again. If we can afford to spend 10 billion on having a few people run around in the rain July and August in an event which will be forgotten in a fortnight, if we can afford to give 10 billion to the International Monetary Fund to prop up the Eurozone, why can we not afford a few million on legal aid? I really don't know.
Thank you very much. Um, I'm no legal expert. My background is uh, political science, and this is the reason for my question. It appears to me that the in intention of your comparison of the legal profession with the medical profession is to highlight an example of the success of self-regulation and perhaps to imply that the legal profession has been unfairly singled out. However, replace the word bar with press complaints committee and replace the word independence with freedom of the press and we suddenly find a very good example of the failure of self-regulation as we have seen this year. So as the democratically elected representatives of the people, doesn't the government have a, a duty to impose external regulation on previously self-regulating industries? Well, that's a very interesting topic. Um, as far as regulation of the press goes, despite everything that's been revealed, I say hands off. This is a blip. In my view, the last thing we need is more government regulation of the press. I know that they have broken the rules, but it's all very contradictory. Did we not all cheer when the Telegraph, by probably illegal means, got a hold of MPs' expenses a few years ago, right? Do we not all cheer when someone d disguises themselves and signs up probably illegally as a cleaner in an old age home and discovers abuse of patients? Did we not all laugh ourselves silly a few years ago when the telephone of Prince Charles and Camilla was hacked and we all had a jolly good time laughing at the, I think they were called Camilla Gate tapes. We only seem to get outraged if we don't like the result. Uh, I think the press has to have freedom. It may be that the Press Complaints Commission should be beefed up a bit. But the notion of the government controlling the press and putting advance um, warnings on it and controlling what it says, I think, is a very bad idea. It's a slippery slope. It's the road to perdition, and I don't like it. Not to mention the fact that newspapers, the printed ones, are probably on their way out. We may be the last generation to rely on them. Uh, I think a lot of young people get their news from Twitter, from the, their iPads and, and computers and what have you, and that is uncontrollable probably sadly, but it is uncon pretty much uncontrollable. So I, unlike everybody else, I'm not terribly bothered about more regulation of the press. I think it's a good idea if we don't have too much monopolistic ownership of the press. That's a different notion. And the effect of all this, I suppose, is to prevent Rupert Murdoch ever extending his empire. Indeed, it will shrink. And that may, in some quarters, be regarded as a good thing. But I would not want to see yet another quango set up. What, to check newspapers before they go out every night at midnight? Make sure there's nothing rude about the government? No, 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 no. I'd rather pay the price with all the hacking and so on. I never thought my phone was rude. I mean, I wish someone would hack me because <laughs> if they want to listen to my messages, you know, I'm on the 634 uh, or whatever it is, they're welcome. And people are collecting vast amounts of money because their phones were hacked, which they don't appear to be giving to charity either. I mean, these film stars, you know, well. You know, they live their lives in public. So I'm, I'm not bothered about that. I, I have failed to see why everyone's getting so excited about it, I'm afraid. Regarding government involvement, what about stuff like the old D notice that, um, I don't know how legal, uh, yes. illegal, how formal yes. that was, but I think when um, government says, don't, don't print that, chaps, yes. nobody did. Yes. Well, we still have a tension even now, don't we, between freedom of information which appears to drag everything out in, into the daylight, and the exemptions in it where the government tries to hide something. For example, I think I read today, that the government is still not willing to reveal to Parliament the so-called risk assessment relating to the Health and Social Welfare Act, which has just been passed, which would show, I suppose, whether there is a risk to our treatment in hospitals uh, from the new act. There are exemptions there, and we live in an uneasy tension between wanting everything to be out in the open, wanting to protect our security, and wanting to keep things private. And sometimes I wonder quite where the dividing lines are. You know, on the one hand, we all want everything to be open, freedom of information, let everybody read everything. On the other hand, if your phone is hacked and you're a film star and someone hears you saying, I'm on the 634, you get £100,000 damages. You know, what is private and what is public? I think we're in an era of flux over that. 
Okay, thank you very much. I'm back in a fortnight talking again about general regulation. Thanks. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.